shortly. A lot of times people don't realize that uh, one of the sacrifices that a missionary has is uh, one of them is not being able to be around family. Uh, you're on the mission field and when things happen and that, a lot of times we missed a lot of funerals, we missed a lot of things through the years uh, because of being on the mission field. And uh, Brother Meredith had to come back because his father uh, uh, had some uh, medical problems and that, and he wanted to come back to see his dad and be here with him. And, and I appreciate, you know, I'm thankful that he had that opportunity to be here with his dad. They don't say more about that, but come on, my brother, appreciate you, thank you. I'm going to apologize, and preachers normally shouldn't apologize, and I'm not apologizing at all for the message, uh, but Tuesday, uh, the allergies here in Springfield really hit me pretty hard. And Tuesday and Wednesday, I was uh, actually quite sick. I'm a lot better today. And I know it is allergy. It's not what people were worried about a few years ago, COVID 1984. But uh, it is it is allergies. And so I'm, I'm feeling a lot better today. But if I cough and I know my throat is a bit scratchy and not sounding like it usually does, please forgive me for that. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be here. Uh, this church has been supporting us for many, many years now. And when your pastor asked people to give verses, I thought about quoting this verse. Often uh, when people ask me to sign their Bibles, which doesn't happen real often, but when they do, normally people put a verse that's be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might or in something very positive. And I, for years, when I do sign a verse, it's Psalm uh, 78 9, which is the children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows turned back in the day of battle. And then I tell people, don't ever let that be said of you. Wow. And it's, it's something of the children of Ephraim, God's people, they were trained, they were ready, they were armed, they had everything they needed, and yet when they were needed, they turned back. And I'm not going to preach on that, but it is a great blessing to uh, see the, the men of God here that are still faithfully serving the Lord. Uh, Brother Norwood, I've known for many, many years. Brother Sowers, I just met, but I've known of him for many, many years. And these two men uh, have faithfully served the Lord when so many that I know that started into the ministry for whatever reason are no longer uh, in ministry. They may still be in church. I'm not saying they've lost their salvation, anything like that. But what a joy to see men that have faithfully served the Lord for many, many, many years. And when I first started on deputation, I was almost always the youngest pastor in the room. Now I'm getting to where quite often I'm one of the older, and especially in Australia, I tend to be one of the older pastors in the room whenever there's any kind of fellowship meeting. But We've been in Australia now for almost 34 years. Uh, here in just another month, it'll be 34 years actually in Australia. I pastored here in Missouri for a couple of years and then was on deputation for a little longer than we needed to be, but the Lord, it, we weren't able to get into the country of the paperwork. That was a quite a struggle. And God has led and blessed in every step of the way. And we're so thankful to be able to serve Him in any capacity because to be quite honest, we're not, I'm not worthy of salvation. God has done so much for me. The fact that he's forgiven me of my sins and promised me a home in heaven, if that's all that God had ever done for me, and he's done far, far, far more than that, I'm not deserving of that. I can praise him for all of eternity just for those two things, having forgiven me of my sins and allowed me to live in heaven with him for all of eternity. But God has blessed again and again and again and again and again so many ways and I'm grateful and thankful and this church thank you for the part that you've played in helping us financially and praying for us there in Australia as your pastor mentioned I'm only back for just a very short time my dad almost died a few weeks ago uh, he's doing better now physically please pray for him uh, spiritually he's not saved he's 89 years old he almost died a few weeks ago uh, it's, it's a real burden on my heart, the fact that my dad's not saved. So please, when you think about it, 
please pray for my dad. My wife and daughters are back in Australia. I've been talking to them every day or two. Uh, it's already almost Monday morning there. Uh, they're 12 hours ahead of us, so uh, it's, uh, it's been interesting trying to talk and remembering the time zones and all of that. When, uh, but God is, is blessing. On your map, we are in Western Australia, and uh, on your map, the town of Mandra is, is there. It's marked out, so that's right where we live, and we have started a work there. Please pray, and I'll mention a little bit more about this in the message, but please pray that God will raise up a man to take the work, an Australian man, be able to pastor the work. We're also praying about moving to another town that's on your map. If you follow the coast of Western Australia and you go up, you'll see Perth. Then you go up, then the, there's three towns on your map. Uh, Geraldton is the other city that's on there. That's about six to seven hours away from where we live, and I'll be talking a little bit about that. We've got a few contacts there and wanting to try to reach into the uh, city of Geraldton. But for now, uh, please turn to Matthew chapter 9. One more thing I will explain. A few years ago, I had cataract surgery, and when they removed the lenses because of the cataracts, they put man-made lenses in there so I can see everybody here. I can read the clock, which before I wouldn't have been able to do that without my glasses. I would have hardly known there was a clock on that wall without my glasses. I can see to drive. I can do almost everything. But sometimes I need to use reading glasses. But when I put these on, everybody, you're all blurry. So I'll probably take them off so I can see you and then put them on to read the, read the scriptures. And so the, they may be going on and off a little bit. And that's the reason why. I'll just get that out of the way before we begin. Matthew chapter 9, verse number 35 through 38. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And Father, I pray that you'd bless your word today as a preacher. Help me to have the physical strength. Help me more importantly to have the spiritual strength that God, you would speak to our hearts and that the words that are spoken would be exactly what would be honoring to thee. May Jesus Christ be lifted up that all men may be drawn unto him. Father, if there is somebody in this building this morning that's never been saved, please especially touch their heart. Draw them to Christ. May they be saved even today. And then God, may each of us who are your children see the burden that Jesus saw. And may we take upon ourselves to be very actively involved in this which he commanded in this passage of scripture. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, if we were going through the book of Matthew verse by verse and having started in chapter 1 and gone all the way through and taking it uh, as it came, you would see uh, all the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ as he's going through Galilee and leading up to this particular passage of scripture. But here what we read is sort of an overview of that ministry. And the things that we read in this passage of Scripture are just as true today as they were 2,000 years ago. So let's take a look, first of all, at the ministry, verse number 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. <clears throat> the ministry. And as we think about the ministry of our Lord, we see where he went. The Bible says all the cities and villages. You know, I'm thankful that Jesus Christ was concerned about taking the gospel to the people. He went to the cities of his day. And that's where there's a great need. Most of the people live in the larger cities. There's so many people. And we think of large cities and we might think about 
uh, Mexico City and Beijing, China, and I could just going on, naming cities where there are tens of millions of people and just far as far as the eye can see and, and some of these cities it might take you the better part of a day just to drive from one part of the city to another and there's just teeming millions upon millions of people and they need the gospel just as much today as they did in the day of the Lord Jesus and we find in his ministry that he went to the cities but I want you to also think about this in this passage of scripture it says not only did he take the gospel to the cities, and that's very, very important. Please don't misunderstand. But I want to skip a little bit and villages. Because while the cities have tremendous need, so many people, and I understand that, Jesus also cared about the people that lived in the villages, the smaller areas where people were. It wasn't just the cities and the villages. In the state that we live in, in Western Australia, Perth is the capital city of our state. Perth is where a great number of people live, depending where you draw the outline of Perth and what uh, census you look at. There's over a million people in Perth and most of the missionaries are in Perth and I understand that, but there's city after town after village in our state where there has never been, to the best of my knowledge, never been an independent Baptist church. Those people need the Lord as well. Jesus was concerned about all people, not only the large cities, but even the smaller villages were important enough to Jesus for him to go there as well. He didn't ignore them just because they didn't have as many people as in the cities. Several years ago, and I had nothing to do with any of this, okay? I want to be careful because I, I don't want to take credit for something I was not a part of. But several years ago, here in Springfield, the church where I'm now a member, Berean Baptist Church, <clears throat> saw there was a need out in Stratford, Missouri. And so a mission work was started out of Berean Baptist of Springfield, started Berean Baptist Church in Stratford, Missouri. Brother John Green was the man that was sent out to, uh, to start the work. And I know that your church has started many, many, many churches, not only here in the United States, but all over the world. And, you know, these little towns, these little cities, these little villages, they need the gospel as well. Notice also, when we think about where he went, the word every is used twice in this particular passage of scripture. He healed every sickness and every disease among the people. Again, I understand that that's speaking about the healing ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it also shows the great concern that Jesus had for everybody. Every person. You know, God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, 9, which is why he commandeth all men everywhere to repent, Acts 17, 30. One man said this, speaking of Jesus, he said he was just as much at home with cultured and educated Nicodemus as he was with outcast Zacchaeus. The Lord visited the home of Simon the leper as willingly as he visited the home of Simon the Pharisee and that of Simon Peter. All men were equally on his heart. Each man, woman, boy, and girl living on earth is an object of his heartfelt concern. Where he went? Everywhere. Everywhere. Taking the gospel to all the people. Not only do we see where he went, but notice what he did. Here in verses, uh, really the whole chapter, we could just go through and just be reading again and again about his ministry. But in this passage, we sum it up with two things. He preached the gospel, something that you and I need to do today. That ministry has not changed. We need to take the gospel to every creature, whether it would be in the larger cities where we, you live or whether it might be in, I don't know. You. Some of you may live out in the countryside, in and around the Springfield area. They need the gospel 
as well. So we need to preach the gospel. But then Jesus also healed the sick, something we cannot do. Having said that, God still can heal miraculously when and if he chooses to do so. Therefore, we ought to pray for the sick. I can't go and lay my hands on them and recover them of their illness, but I can certainly pray for them. And when God chooses, he can heal them of anything that he chooses to do so. So that's the ministry, where he went and what he did. <clears throat> I wish I could heal of all sickness. I would take care of this throat thing, but I can't. From the ministry, we go to the multitudes in verse number 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. The multitudes. When Jesus saw the multitudes, and by the way, when he saw them, he saw them as no one else could see them. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And when he looked upon the people, he not only saw their outward, but he could see inward. He knew what was in their hearts. He knew what was in their life. He knew the burdens that they carried. He knew the uh, desires of their heart. But as we look into this passage of scripture, we see that when Jesus saw the multitudes, we see his reaction. The Bible tells us he was moved with compassion on them. His heart was broken for these people because of his great love for them. Compassion. He saw the multitudes. Sometimes I don't like to be in areas where there are just huge numbers of people in a little small space. Kind of like a plane that I'm going to be getting on, Lord willing, Tuesday morning. You know, you line up and they, they call these rows, but people are, you know, they're impatient and they jump the queue and they get in ahead of time and they want to get in and, and there's all these people and, and just a little tiny, I don't like that. All right, I really don't. But Jesus looked at the multitudes, the teeming thousands or maybe larger than that. The Bible doesn't actually tell us how many were there that day. But we know that Jesus preached to great numbers as well as individuals. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. The great love that he had for them. Folks, no one ever loved you like Jesus. Amen. When Jesus sees you today, just as he saw the multitudes in this day, he knows what's going on in your life. He knows the burdens that you carry. He knows the needs that you have, the sorrows that you may have gone through recently or may be going through now that I'm unaware of. I want you to know this. God knows and cares about you. He knows everything about you and still loves you. What a wonderful God we serve. He knows and cares. He loves you like no one loves you. My wife, I've been away from my wife and daughters. We, by the way, have a son that lives in San Diego, California. But I've been away from my wife and daughters now for four weeks. I miss them. I really do. I love them. I'm looking forward, not to the trip. I am looking forward to being back with them. Because I miss them and love them dearly. And my wife and daughters love me. But no one loves me as much as my God loves me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But have everlasting life. I can tell you today. Do you know that the, the preachers of Spurgeon's day. Got, some of the preachers of Spurgeon's day. Got mad at him. Because he would say to the great numbers of people. That would come to hear him preach there. At the tabernacle in London. He would say something like this. God loves you. And some of the preachers got mad because they said, no, God only loves a certain few. No, God loves each and every one. Not all are saved, understand that, but God loves you. If you're saved, God loves you. If you're here today and lost, God loves you as well. And the compassion that Jesus had, 
the love that he had for these people, the multitudes, his reaction. He was moved with compassion, and here's the reason. Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Some of these people were no doubt very, very successful in their business, in their chosen profession. Some of these people, as the world would look at it, might think they don't have a care in the world. God saw them and knew they had many cares. They had many needs. The greatest need, whether they were successful in business, whether they were begging on the street corner and everything in between, Jesus knew that the greatest need that these people had was for salvation. They needed a relationship with God. They needed to have their sins forgiven because as one young person reminded us today, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God's level is absolute perfection. We have sinned and come short of the holiness of God. We are not fit for heaven, but in Christ we're made fit for heaven. One day those who are saved will be made the righteousness of God in him and will be presented faultless before him, Jude tells us. Woo! What a wonder, what a joy, what a blessing. But Jesus, as he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Why? Here's the reason. They were as sheep, they fainted rather, scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Jesus saw that there was no one to love them. No one to teach them the truth of the gospel. No one who cared for their soul. And it moved him. A genuine, heartfelt compassion upon these people. They did not have that which they needed the most. The ministry... I don't know about Canada, but in Australia, we have a lot of sheep. And you know, we see the sheep, and, and I don't say that they take care of the sheep today in the same way as they took care of the sheep in Bible days with the shepherd leading the sheep and all the great teaching that we could look at in the scriptures. But Jesus saw these people, they, they were sheep, but without a shepherd. No one to watch over and lead and provide and protect and all the many wonderful things that the great shepherd does for his sheep. <coughs> Sorry, the ministry, the multitudes, and then the message. All of that is kind of really introduction to this last point. The message, verse number 50, uh, 37 through 38. Then after all these things that we've talked about, then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Huh. Multitudes upon multitudes, but so few laborers to bring the harvest home. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. This is the message that Jesus gave to his Followers, his disciples. I understand he was speaking to the eleven. Judas was there, but Jesus knew he was not a safe man. But by application, he's saying the same message to you and to me today. The harvest. It's just as great as it's always been. Yeah. The laborers are few. Pray. Notice in this message the concern. Then say at the end of his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Untold millions are still untold. Not only around the world, and we know that the field is the world, but let's narrow it down around this country. And no, I'm not talking. I can fly that to Australia, where I am, but I'm here in the United States right now, and untold millions are still untold right here in the United States. Yeah. You know, people need the gospel in Australia. They do. 
Almost every missionary, when they come in and they share the field where God has called them and the burden that they have, and they make it, uh, you know, they, they tell you about people that are in that particular country and places that are in that country where the gospel has not been preached, and all of that's true, but let's not forget that there are people right here in the Ozarks yeah. that need the gospel. Oh, but uh, there's so many churches and the, the, the this is the belt. I mean, the buckle on, on the Bible belt. So, what? People need the gospel. We need to have a compassion for people right here in the Springfield and surrounding area where you live, or Kentucky, if you have come all the way from that ungodly area. Boy, they really need the gospel in Kentucky, amen? amen. You know, now, I've said that in somewhat of a lighthearted manner because of those who are here today. You understand that. But it's serious. They need the gospel in Kentucky. They need the gospel in Western Australia. They need the gospel all around the world. The concern is people need to know the Lord. When we see how few independent Baptist churches there are in Western Australia, the state that I live in, it concerns me. <clears throat> when we first went to Western Australia, and some of you might remember that we were going to go to Tasmania, and I could, I don't have time to get into how the Lord led differently in that moment, but I'm concerned for Tasmania. It's a part of Australia, but now I've been living in Western Australia these almost 34 years. There were already churches in Western Australia, but so few. And as I looked at the state and I saw city after city and town and village where there was no independent Baptist church, it moved me. It broke my heart. They need a church to get the gospel out to them, that they might know the Lord and be saved. And when I, this many years later, 34 years later, there are some more churches now than there were then, but it still moves me how few churches there are. When you look around and you see how few independent Baptist churches there are, it should move you. Geraldton, I mentioned earlier, we've been working in Mandra. Hope to see an Australian man to take over the work as pastor <coughs> for us to move up to Geraldton. But six hours away, a city that we've been praying about and, and the Lord has really burdened us about. And, and as far again, as far as I know, there's never been an independent Baptist church there. They have all different types of churches and many of the people there have been exposed to religion, but very, very few have ever heard the gospel. Most of the people in Geraldton, and I'm sure there are some who are saved, but the vast majority of them, they're not saved. And it burdens me to want to see a church established there. And so, long story, short version for time's sake, we've been able to, through the work of another independent Baptist church in Western Australia, we've been able to come into a couple of contacts up in that city, and I'm wanting to go and, and to uh, travel up there and to have Bible studies with them or some kind of an outreach into Geraldton. I can't be there all the time. I can't leave our people in Mandurah. I can't leave them without a, a, a man to pastor to leave them until God gives us an Australian man. But I'm concerned about Geraldton and want to go up there and, and have as much outreach into Geraldton. And I could keep talking about city after town after village where there is no independent Baptist church that they might hear the gospel and be saved. And it moves me. And I know that Springfield, Missouri, I know that Springfield, Missouri has many, many, many independent Baptist churches and how many are really doing the job? And I, I'm not the Holy Spirit. But how many are, and how many areas in and around are you moved with compassion to try to reach out, to reach out, to reach out into the field? That's the concern we should have. The harvest truth.
Scripture leaves plenteous. The laborers are few. I mentioned COVID, and I forget what year they, I just always call it COVID-1984. And I have reasons for that, but uh, I'll not get into that. That's different. I'm not going to meddle when I preach. But uh, during COVID, our state, like most of the rest of the country, basically shut everything down. There were people that lived in our state. I'm talking about Australian citizens who had businesses and homes who for no fault of their own were out of the state and all of a sudden they just shut down the borders. People weren't even allowed to get back into their own state, in their own home. Well, in Australia, there's a lot of uh, fruit growing and there's a lot of other farming and that, but they, raise, but they grow a lot of fruit and they're used to the farmers in Australia are used to having backpackers come in, mainly Europeans, but some from the Pacific Islands. And these are people that would come over to Australia. They were just there temporarily. They would work for maybe four or five days, make a bit of money, and then sort of uh, go to the next place and just there for experience. And the farmers are used to these people coming and bringing in the fruit. When harvest time comes, they meet the backpackers there. And when COVID hit and everything shut down, great harvests went to waste. Acres and acres, hectares just, just of oranges or bananas or peaches, whatever it may have been, were just rotted because there were not the workers to bring the harvest in. And that's sad. Wow. To see that on television and to see farmers that had to plow up their fields and just plow the, the fruit into the ground, not because the fruit wasn't edible and, and, and worthy of being sold. They just didn't have anybody to bring in the crop. And it broke my heart. And these, Some of these farmers committed suicide because they had so many talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars invested and they needed to bring the fruit in and sell it and pay their bills and, and they, they live like that. No one to bring in the fruit. Now Jesus is giving us a parable in this passage of scripture. We understand the earthly aspect of this parable. But a parable is an earthly story to teach us a heavenly truth the, the heavenly, the spiritual application of this is as sad as it is to see a harvest go to waste. Souls are of far greater value than apples or bananas or pineapple or whatever it may be. And Jesus was telling the disciples and he was telling us there are souls everywhere who need the gospel. They need Jesus Christ. We need to try to reach them. We need to take the message to them. We need to be concerned. And here's the command. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Are we concerned enough to see the need? How are we ever going to bring that harvest in? Well, Jesus said in this passage, pray Asking God to call laborers into his harvest. Now who God calls in answer to this prayer, that's up to God. Jesus did say, pray that God will send Mr. Jones. He just said, you pray that God would call men into the ministry. Who God calls is up to him. When God calls is up to him. Where God sends those people, that's up to him. It's not up to the pastor. It's not up to some man-made mission authority. It's not up to any individual. That's God's dealing. But here's what he does tell us and commands us to do is to pray that God would call those that he would choose and that those that God does call would surrender to that call and be sent out into the ministry. We need men in Australia. 
Please pray that God would call men. Now, again, it's God who calls, not me. But I'd ask you, please pray, as Jesus commanded us here, to pray that God would call men into the ministry, that they would surrender to that call, that I'd be able to train them, that they would go in answer to the direction of the Holy Spirit of God where he would lead them. Well, my job is to pray that God would call. Once they do surrender to that call, then there's more that I can do, but for now, pray. And by the way, have, have you ever told somebody <coughs> maybe they had a physical need, some great burden they were going through, you say, well, I really can't do it, but the least I can do is pray for you. That, that's wrong. Do you know that really the most that you can do for someone is to pray for them? Right. Think about what prayer is. Prayer transports us from here in Springfield, Missouri to the throne room of God. We go over into the very presence of God. We're communicating with the creator of this universe and we're praying and sharing our burdens, our needs, our desires with God. I know that sometimes prayer can be a cop out. Sometimes you say, well, I'll pray for you when you really could help them in other ways. But prayer is not the least you can do for someone. Prayer is the most you can do for someone. Please pray that God would call man in Australia or Canada or wherever because the field is the world. Please pray that God would call them, that they would surrender, and that they would go. You know, the church at Antioch obeyed this commandment, and they were richly blessed by God. In Acts chapter 13, why don't you turn over there just quickly, please. In Acts chapter 13, we read in verse number 1, Now there were at the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, five men ministering and serving at the church, already called into the ministry, already serving there at the church of Antioch. Notice verse number two. And as they, this is the church, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed into these different areas. And the greatest missionary endeavor that we've ever seen in the history of this world began with the church at Antioch faithfully serving God and part of what they were doing. They were fasting and praying. And though the Bible doesn't say what they were praying about, I believe that they were praying that God would call men into his harvest field because the very next thing that we see is that God called two of those five and called them to the work he had called them to and the church sent them out. Barnabas and Saul or Paul. Pray. You know, the church at Antioch was praying that God would call men into the ministry. And God blessed them tremendously for it. Usually people think, well, you're a missionary. Why aren't you talking about money? <laughs> you know, the Bible talks about money. The Bible talks about giving towards missions. But not in the passage that we're in this morning. And so all of the teaching and preaching that you've heard from different from your pastor or others on giving. I'm not minimizing that at all. But for this passage, for this morning, here's what I'm saying. Here's what Jesus said. Compassion from the heart on the lost because of their great spiritual need should cause you to pray. And you know what? If you, are, if you have as much compassion on the lost that you're faithfully and earnestly praying that God would call them into the ministry, you're going to be given. Yeah. You just will, because there's that need that when God does call them for those men to be sent, to be taken care of, and, and all these various things. So I'm not overlooking the giving, but I'm staying in this particular passage for now. Pray, please, the command, the command, pray, the Lord will harvest. Well, in closing, Grace Bible Baptist Church, 
What is your heart seeing? I'm not talking about your eyes, but your heart. When Jesus saw the multitude, he saw them with his physical, earthly, human eyes, but his heart saw far beyond what his eyes saw. He was moved with compassion. What is your heart seeing when you see a person without Christ? Does it move you with compassion or is it, oh well, just one more. How about, not only when you see a person without Christ, how about when you see a place without a church? What is your heart seeing? And then what is your heart saying? about personal involvement. Jesus said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. Each individual, God has commanded, be involved, not only through prayer, but then telling people as well about the good shepherd, about Jesus Christ, about their need for salvation. We need to be involved in telling people about the Lord as well as praying that God would send forth those that he calls into his harvest field. Personal involvement is what it's going to take. But then also persistent intercession when you pray that God would call men to his field. And by the way, you know one reason why some people don't pray? And I understand they're men. Maybe they just don't have the compassion. Maybe they're not seeing like they need to see. Maybe they're not saved. I don't know. But if all of that is there, one more reason why sometimes people don't pray is because sometimes they're afraid God might call one of their children. I love my children dearly. One of them lives in California. I miss him every day. Two of them are still living at home. I don't know for how much longer. You know, if God was to call one of my children to go to the mission field, that's where I would want them to be. Would I miss them? Absolutely. When God called me to go to the mission field, I knew I was going to miss my parents. My parents, neither one were saved. They couldn't understand why we would go all the way to Australia. Don't people in America need, aren't there places in America that need churches? I was asked that question by my lost parents. Not because they were so super spiritual. They just didn't want us to go all the way to Australia. And I miss them. I miss my brothers and sisters, my wife's family. But when God calls you to go, when, when you're praying, God might call someone in your family to go. God might call you. Don't be so busy praying for Mr. Jones that as God speaks to your heart and says, well, I'm sending you. No, 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 Lord, I'm praying you call somebody else. Oh, there's a great need. Lord, please call somebody else. Would you pray? And would you be listening that I'm not, I am not God. I'm not calling anybody, but the Holy Spirit does. And if the Holy Spirit touches your heart, would you go if God did? Call you. We've seen the ministry, the multitudes, the message. Let's pray that God would call men into his harvest field. Let's be involved in taking the message to those around us where we are. And let's be listening that if God calls you that you would surrender and say yes Lord here am I send me God works through his churches with this church and I know you've got a great history of missions sending and all that thank you but I also want to encourage you to keep with it keep doing that which God has commanded for us to do would you stand together with heads bowed and eyes closed? I don't know. I didn't talk to the pastor ahead of time. I know sometimes churches do things differently. I do not, do not, do not want to uh, overstep any uh, of my...
you know, get into doing what I ought not to do. But I do want to ask you this morning. Are you saved? Yeah. Do you know the Lord? Jesus was moved with compassion because these people did not have a Savior. There's only one, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. It's only through Christ, and it's only received by grace. Many times I talk to people in Australia. Oh, I've been baptized, preacher. Oh, I go to church. Or I've done all these wonderful things. If they don't know the Lord, one day Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Has there been a time and a place in your life that you realized you were a sinner and guilty? You were a sinner, guilty before God. Understood that Jesus Christ paid the price for your sin and totally and completely turned from that sin, trusting in Christ, received him as Savior. If not, I point you to Christ. He is the way of salvation. He's the only way of salvation. Please receive him as your Lord and Savior. Then if you are saved, how's your compassion toward the lost in your own family? Those you work with. Those that you meet every day when you go to the grocery store or the bank or wherever you would be. Are you trying to reach them for Christ? And then are you praying that God would call man into the ministry? Are you listening that God might call you? As the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart here in a moment, we're going to have an invitation, and I would ask you to do what God is already dealing with your heart to do. Father, please bless your word. Bless each person here. I know that you see the needs. You see in the heart, there may be someone that needs to respond to this invitation at this time. Please, God, if that's the case, draw them to yourself and that they would respond. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we begin.